Hey, Dave. So for those of you who don't know Dave, um, Supervisor Cortese has been on the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors um, for over a decade with four years as board president. And prior to that, he served uh, for eight years on the San Jose City Council. In his uh, various roles in public service, he has had uh, you know, not just a toe in the transportation water, but like, you know, his whole body uh, involved in transportation uh, as chair of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, also with the Valley Transportation Authority, uh, and other hats that have exposed him to the transportation world. So he, and he also grew up in San Jose. He lives at the base of the foothills uh, on the east side, which means he has access to all of those wonderful uh, roads that many of us recreational cyclists uh, go up and ride our bikes on. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it over to Dave and just ask him to introduce himself for, for five minutes, tell us uh, a little bit about himself, his role in transportation, and then we're just going to do a very informal conversation. I have some questions prepared. I'm going to try to keep it provocative. I'll try to make you mad, Dave. I'll try to, you know, uh, keep things interesting and then also we'll be having we'll be pulling questions out of the chat box that people have for you so Dave thanks so much for being here no thank you Shiloh and um, thank you to everyone who's been um, supporting uh, the coalition you know not only today but in the past and and trying to figure out ways to do that during the pandemic um, you know it, you can't say that enough I know after four and a half months or more of this uh, shelter in place and so forth, it's almost become weirdly tried to say, hey, we're doing this even though there's a pandemic, but you know, you can't state it enough and it's a lot of work. And thank you for your leadership and making sure that um, the, the easy way isn't the way people are taking, which could be just to say, hey, you know, we can't do this this year or we can't do what we usually do. Um, there's no time for that kind of thinking. Um, so I'm grateful to be here, but I'm grateful for all of you. As, Sh as Shiloh mentioned, I'm, you know, a lifelong resident of the area, uh, aside for a, a birth experience at Fort Ord uh, Army Hospital in Monterey, just before I was moved uh, to a prune orchard in uh, the Evergreen area. San Felipe Road is another good road uh, for recreational cyclists. Uh, at least the upper part of it still is, I think. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, and I talk about this sometimes um, when I'm speaking uh, to uh, to cyclists and people are trying to to advance the cause. You know, it, there's something to be said. I think when you look back um, at a kid who grew up in a rural area um, where two things were different back then, I think, than right now. One, um, once you know you were off your training wheels, literally and figuratively. Um, there was kind of a familial trust that you you were safe uh, to to go off and and uh, and ride your bike, but you know not just around a cul-de-sac in my um, in my kind of upbringing. But if you wanted to go anywhere that was you know sort of a a destination like the drugstore, um, you you had to take your bike and go. I mean there weren't weren't any real better alternatives or other alternatives. Um, and the reason I say that is because at some point, maybe during the q and I'd, I'd like to continue talking about that theme of, you know, how we advance a movement by bringing children along and how we bring children along, maybe in a different way than we bring adults on along who are, who are of course critical. We're all critical as adults to be voters and movers and shakers and stakeholders and get things done. Um, and to show up at city council meetings and board of supervisors meetings and so forth. Um, but there's a whole other piece of this, I think, that um, we, we ought to be looking at in terms of uh, sort of a different approach to children. And I know, um, I know the coalition you know, does that. I, I certainly don't mean to be preaching to the choir here, um, but it's certainly something that um, is directly connected to my experience and upbringing. Fast forward, uh, coming out of that rural environment and everything um, and after you know literally 20 years in the in the business community as a business person mostly in the East Valley but in other places here in the county I run for city council at the age of 45 years old and um, spent eight years there you could do the math I spent 11 and a half years on the board of supervisors now but something happened when I first got to the city council that 
I didn't really plan. And um, that was uh, then Mayor Ron Gonzalez, you know, who, as we all know, is a huge transportation advocate, all modalities, um, said to pull me in the office and said, um, you're on VTA. It was a, essentially a, a mayoral appointment to be on the VTA. But I also want you to try to get on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. San Jose has no representation, and it's the regional body by which you know, all state, federal dollars, and, and a lot of decisions are made um, impacting the South Bay. And, and you know, basically what he was saying in sort of political terms is, you know, make friends, do what you need to do, and try to, and try to figure out how to get on there. And at some point, try to get San Jose permanent representation on the MTC. And all, all of those things somehow, some way, um, became a reality. And, um, you know, it, the, the point I wanted to make, though, was I, I didn't really seek out becoming a transportation expert or becoming an expert around modalities uh, uh, or cycling in terms of the whole bike ped uh, infrastructure world. But if you do the math again, 2001, uh, through 2020, um, I have been nonstop in the thick of it. I, I finally got a permanent position on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in 2007, six years after that conversation with the mayor. And I've been there ever since. I chaired the commission. You know, and what a wonderful, not just honor, but opportunity to be in a position like that where you get to vote on things like, and vote over the top of some of our agencies, by the way, I don't want to offend anyone, uh, Caltrans or anyone else, but, you know, to cast a vote supporting uh, the cantilever uh, bike path on, on the Bay Bridge. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to, to cast votes to finish that sometime in the future, you know, make, put it all the way through. So um, those are some of the broad brush, you know, sort of opportunities I've had. Shiloh, I know you're, you're familiar with that. Um, there's you know, over that many years, of course, um, a thousand backstories and, you know, another hundred great opportunities I've had to, to, to cast votes or to persuade people to, to do what I think is the right thing, especially in terms of the cycling community. So um, thank you all, especially those of you who are voters uh, who, you know, allow people like me to get in positions like this because, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly a great opportunity. And with that, I'll stop. We could do questions maybe. Great, awesome. And, and I love that you brought up kids. Let's definitely get back to that. Uh, but just to drill down a little bit on the MTC piece, because uh, that's, that's an interesting story with, with uh, former Mayor Ron Gonzalez. I didn't know that, uh, that you had been uh, basically drafted to go and um, you know, be, be a force at MTC. And it speaks to, I think it speaks to, um, something that we grumble about down here in the South Bay, and that is governance on MTC. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could just comment on what it was like before, what we were trying to remedy, has it been remedied? And then in as much as you've had visibility, I imagine you have, into the current Caltrain um, situation, and, because, and this spreads uh, at VTA as well, right? The, the cities on the west side wish that they had more representation at VTA. San Jose says, no, we're big. We need, you know, of course we need more representation on VTA. Everybody's complaining about governance that they don't have enough influence on these bodies. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that at, BT at um, MTC and then now with Caltrain it being really uh, in the fore at Caltrain? Yeah, it's, um, um, there's a lot to talk about there, of course. So let me do the, the quick overview, but there's some, there's important history there. Um, and before I forget, you know, one of the things that I started to advance once I got, just before I got to MTC, I had been the president of the Association of Bay Area Governments, which is the Council of Governments. All 101 cities and nine counties in the Bay Area are part of this thing called ABAG. And ABAG is completely separate from MTC, and we were the only region in the, in the United States that had a setup like that. So you have an ABAG over here trying to do housing and MTC doing transportation, and you wonder why we have no connectivity <laughs> or little connectivity at times. Uh, one of the things I, I have to say I'm a little proud of is that I, I fought for years to merge those two agencies, and we um, succeeded finally a few years ago uh, with a, a lot of fighting about governance. Um, 
you know, merging, essentially merging those two entities together, the staffs are completely merged now. Um, and they work together side by side. They're on, literally on the same payroll. Uh, what a difference, I think, in terms of doing things like, you know, basically planning the Bay Area and connectivity and things like that. But the problem that um, I know you're alluding to that existed um, when Mayor Gonzalez first had that first conversation with me in 2001, more specifically was, here we are in the South Bay, Santa Clara County, the fastest growing uh, county in the region, both from a housing standpoint and a transportation needs standpoint and a population standpoint um, and an economic standpoint, you know, from a GDP standpoint. I mean, you put every button that you could look at or every box you could check off, um, we are beyond everyone. The biggest city in, in the Bay Area is our county seat, San Jose, right? So um, we had no representation at all on MTC. MTC in those days um, had less members than it does now. And the two that came from this county were one, um, a, a representative that was nominated by the small cities um, in, by a, what we call a mayor's conference or a thing called the Cities Association um, that probably few people are familiar with, but they get to appoint someone from this county. And it was at that time, it was a guy named Dean Chu from the city of Sunnyvale. And, um, and the county board had a rep. It used to be Ken Yeager, a good friend of mine and, and a great transportation advocate. But the city itself, the biggest city in the region, had, had no appointment, had no way to get anybody on the MTC, which was just plain weird, really. Um, so I got the, um, the MTC on a split vote by one vote after a lot of wrangling um, to agree to sponsor a bill called in those days, AB 57, guess who carried it? Jim Bell. Uh, Jim Bell became our advocate for that. He had previously chaired the commission, much like I did, and um, probably did a better job than me in his time. But he's now, you know, obviously he's in the state legislature. And he says, all, at that time, he was in the assembly. And he says, I'll carry this bill. And you can't imagine how many times that bill was almost killed, uh, you know, particularly by, I won't, I won't call anyone out, but, you know, our our rivals for money in other counties north of us um, didn't want to see that go through. And proportionately, we should have had four seats by population. Proportionately, if you went by population, we had two. The bill goes through, it gets signed into law. We have three now. And basically, that's why Mayor Ricardo's on the MTC um, along with me. And we still have a representative from uh, the Cities Association. Uh, I believe that's Jeannie Bruins right now. So we have three votes and it changes things. You know, it changes things. Just basic politics 101. Um, the commission has 21 members. There's uh, about four members who are non-voting members. So you can see where just one more seat, one more vote helps you build alliances. And it's helped us stick together with some counties like Alameda, Contra Costa. You know, they have very similar interests to us and even San Mateo at times. So. Um, Cal, you could see why something like Caltrain, which is uh, a joint powers authority consisting of Santa Clara, San Francisco, primarily Santa Clara, San Francisco, and San Mateo counties, um, over the years would also develop governance issues. You know, um, things, if things were working perfectly well with governance, the Bay Area in these agencies, we wouldn't be facing, you know, the, the lack of things that we're facing. We wouldn't be facing the connectivity issues. So every time there's a, a chance for anybody who wants to see good government um, consolidation or better governance, all it takes is somebody to say, hey, we need to do a regional transportation measure, uh, a revenue measure, a tax measure, or something like that. And uh, the governance issue pops back up. And that's exactly what just happened over the last couple of days, in fact. It's just being settled today that uh, it looks like uh, Caltrain will be able to put their sales tax on the ballot, which is important to all of us. Um, but it wasn't without some folks, you know, trying to, to ask that they, they get some housekeeping done on their governance. And it's, these are old issues. These aren't things that people are bringing up at the last minute, even though in the media, it seems like that sometimes. Uh, so, you know, lots of backstories on, on governance um, being an issue. You know, I know for a lot of people, it's like alphabet soup. 
ABAG, MTC, Galtrain, what are all these things? Um, but it's really worth paying attention to it. I know you know that, Shiloh. Um, you, you talk to me all the time about it and about making sure there's funding there for, you know, bike share and things like that, or, or that things like that just don't go away um, while somebody's not paying attention. And I, I wish we had, you know, a more grassroots strong lobby um, at MTC. The, the darn thing is, is housed in San Francisco. It used to be housed in Oakland. So you can imagine there's not a lot of people from the South Bay that trek up there for meetings to raise their voices. But it's actually a little easier now with Zoom, so <laughs> and cleaner for our air too. So, uh, so maybe we'll see more South Bay vocalism in the future. Yeah, yeah. No, government governance is really important. He he who makes the rules uh, rules the coop, right? Um, so, getting back to the the conversation about kids, and I'm glad you brought it up because yesterday we kicked off the day uh, with. Um, highlighting some public opinion research that actually you guys at the County of Santa Clara funded. Uh, um, it was the first time that we did this kind of this some public opinion research at this scale on why people choose to transport themselves the way that they do. And one of the pieces of information that came out that doesn't necessarily surprise us, but helps us understand then, you know, and inform policy decisions is that if you rode as a child, if you learned to ride a bike as a child and you continued riding through middle school and high school, you are much more likely to continue riding as an adult, which just underscores the importance of all of our programs that invest in teaching kids how to ride. So you brought it up, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, what are, what are the ways that, that the county or the various agencies can be um, funneling more money into these programs and then especially at this time and I don't know if you've given much thought to this but how do we teach kids when they're not in school technically yeah it's um, I mean we're learning a lot of a lot of new things or bringing back some old things or some things that probably should have happened a long time ago like closing the digital divide in terms of how we communicate with our youth um, I just um, fashioned a 7.1 million dollar um, investment from the County Board of Supervisors to the County Office of Education and school districts to, to close out the digital divide with about 15,000 families right now as quickly as possible. Uh, it's just unconscionable to tell families and kids they need to learn from home and then not give them the hookup to do it. You know, um, what a disaster that is. But uh, assuming that you have you know, virtual ways to communicate, it's, it's not a bad medium, as we all know, we're doing it now. And, um, and it is a lot better for the environment in many ways. So um, here's what I think, you know, I think, I think moving really to the next level in terms of, of, of cycling and bike transportation is a movement. It's, it's gotta be a movement. It, it's, you know, we, you've done a great job. A lot of people have done a great job in terms of moving the needle you know, incremental change, fighting for those projects, fighting for certain things that show up in a capital improvement budget at the regional level or state level or local level. But at some point, I think this needs to be more like climate, more like if you think back on the anti-tobacco movement, where did that really start? You know, it, it became kids telling their parents, quit smoking, um, that's not good for you. Um, it needs to become kids saying, we don't need to jump in the car to go down to CVS. Let's ride our bikes. Um, that's what I want to do. That's what my teacher says to do. You know, that's what I just heard, you know, online. Um, and it, it, we need to create that. I do think, and, and we also need to create, I think when I say safety, <laughs> um, I think there's obviously a couple different mentalities out there. I mean, if you're a touring cyclist, you know, bike lanes, oh, um, I mean, I, so a lot of people I talk to, you know, and, and we all know this, say, I, I don't need them. I don't want them. I'm taking a lane. I, you know, I have a right. Uh, I don't need to be segregated into a bike lane. But I don't know if you're a parent, and let's say you're in the east foothills of San Jose, and your child wants to go over to East Ridge Mall. Um, isn't it, wouldn't it be nice if they're a fourth grader or a sixth grader to be able to put, you know, say, ride your bike, knowing that there was a, a spine, you know, um, that was safe for them to travel on to get back and forth. And here we're funding a light rail line. Let's get back to transportation. 
We're trying to finish that line to the East Ridge Transit Center, which will take people all the way to the BART station in Milpitas. You know, I'm sure a lot of adult cyclists are going to jump on at East Ridge, you know, and end up in San Francisco or Sausalito eventually on their bikes. But um, that said, how does a kid do that without crossing the new train tracks? You know, we, we there's some of us who have fought for that and said, you, you, you need to create the safe crossings now. You need to plan that now. It's not so much for the adult cyclists, the sophisticated cyclists, but if we really want the movement to start with young people, we got to, we, you know, we got to get back to almost that, that kind of thinking that for them, we need to create infrastructure that is almost as safe as a rural environment, that they can move freely without mom and dad or whoever worrying about, are they going to make it? You know, do I really want them crossing the light rail tracks, you know, to try to get um, to where they're going? And these are, these are huge issues that I think can stunt or bottleneck um, what, what I'm calling a movement that frankly is going to be absolutely mandatory in terms of, of the climate issue. I mean, it's, it's going to be mandatory that we're out of our cars um, and we can do it. We just figured out during this pandemic, we don't really need them. I'm talking to people who are forgetting where their local gas station is now because they haven't <laughs> been driving their cars. That is good. Um, so, but we need to, we need to weave our, our children into this in a way that maybe just sort of a separate strategy or approach than the, than the battles that we're fighting on, on behalf of our adult cycling population. Yep, yep. As always, it's up to the kids. Totally agree. Uh, I want to switch gears to a, a little more somber topic, um, and that is, you know, with the with the killing of George Floyd and others, as well as protests against police brutality and systemic racism, um, you know, that has led many to reconsider the role of police in many aspects of society, including traffic enforcement, which is really important to the bicycle community. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, alternatives to traditional policing, such as automated speed enforcement, um, traffic enforcement being done by a parking attendant as opposed to an armed police officer. Um, and to give you a little, little more context, um, many in, in the active transportation movement have been um, distancing themselves even further from enforcement. And, and that holds true for SVBC. We lead with design as one of the key ways that we keep the streets safe. You know, just, just make the streets so that it's designed in a way that people are not going to speed down the street. You know, slow folks down, have protected bike lanes. These are the kinds of things that keep bicyclists safe without needing a police officer. So I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's so important. You know, um, we saw in the, in the late 90s um, and early 2000s, just before I became a city council member representing the Evergreen area, a thing was developed out there called the Evergreen Specific Plan, you know, where the city did a terrific job of essentially building traffic calming right into the streets. I mean, you're way better off in Evergreen riding your bike uh, down to, you know, the, the so-called, you know, Evergreen Square, Village Square, if you live in a radius of uh, half a mile to a mile around. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense to get into your car. It's like going through a maze, but on your bike, you can go, boom, direct right there. Uh, or walk, you know, but um, um, it's back to back to cops. Look, you know, yes, we need to to do things that correspond to replacing badges and guns. You know, when it comes to traffic enforcement, routine traffic enforcement, or traffic direction. You know, how often do we see? You know, kind of gratefully. I mean, you know, a light goes stoplight brakes or something like that and you see um, an officer out there with a badge and the gun you know usually doing the terrific job of directing people around but really uh, you need an armed officer to do that and and isn't it you know if somebody pulls up that's having a mental you know somebody he, he, or, he or she runs into somebody that's having a mental health episode out there which is probably you know as likely at that point as somebody you know, trying to do a violent crime at a broken intersection light, you know, that, that cop's not, not generally equipped to deal with that, to do that kind of crisis intervention. And, and this is what, this is kind of what we, the situation that we built for ourselves is that 
our first responders on, on things like mental health episodes, which is a medical issue, um, show up with guns and badges because that's what they're told to do. That's the system we built. You know, you wouldn't want to vilify the actual cops too much. They, they didn't ask for that job. And I think a lot of them would very much like to get out of that kind of work. Same thing with responding to homelessness issues. That should not be done, uh, I don't think, ever um, with, you know, armed officers. Uh, you know, the, the fact that in most of our big cities, it's the police department sweeping homeless, um, you know, out of, out of encampments. Why? Um, you know, why are, why are we using crisis intervention folks for that? Why aren't we using social workers for that? Why are we sweeping them in the first place is probably a bigger question. Why aren't we uh, placing them um, in the kind of uh, transitional housing and support services that they need? Um, but I think what you've seen round one since George Floyd is a lot of, it's not nibbling around the edges, but it's kind of like a first layer of, of change that doesn't run very deep yet. Um, counties like ours and cities saying, okay, we'll do this and this and this and this, because that's the easy stuff we can do right now. What's really gonna be required is restructuring where the money goes. And, and that's why this mantra, this notion of defund police, it, it it makes sense if, if people understand what it really means, you know, in government terms, it, it doesn't mean completely defund every aspect of, of, of law enforcement um, to the extent you need that to deal with uh, serial killers and, and, and violent crimes and so forth. But to, to defund or restructure the funding streams that are now going to those departments that really should be going somewhere else or to at least to a different kind of worker. Uh, years ago, I got in trouble with temporarily with the probation department in the county of Santa Clara because they said, um, I want to, I want to, I want to shut down juvenile hall. There were 350 kids in juvenile hall. There's 50 now. Um, so we, we almost got there, but I, they said, they thought I wanted to shut it down overnight and lay them all off, lay off the probation officers. And I said, no, what I want to do is I want, to have a system that makes juvenile hall unnecessary or at least uh, less necessary than it is to, to have 350 kids in there. And where I don't wanna lay off probation officers, I want probation officers to be like social workers who are out in the community uh, intervening ahead of time so that kids aren't getting booked. And you know, they said, oh, okay, that, that's, that's good, we can do that. And this is the same kind of thing we need to do with the adult population, we need to get away from this, you know, lock them up as, as the immediate knee-jerk first reaction. Oh, there's somebody that looks like a DUI in a parking lot at a fast food restaurant. How fast can we handcuff them and lock them up? You know, how about intervention? Um, do, do we really need another person with a rap sheet, especially a person of color? Uh, so we got a lot of work to do. Uh, I don't want, I could go on and on. We all could. I know, I appreciate the question. Um, but back to transportation, let me just close by saying we've done some good things out here in my supervisorial district and um, you know in the East Foothills. Some of you are probably aware that there was a, a kind of an argument uh, a little over a year ago about bike lanes on McKee Road. You know, the city said we're going to put them in, but hadn't really done much of a community process. Of course, all the people in their cars trying to get home from work said. Um, you're not going to eliminate a lane, a car lane, to do that. And, um, it, and it looked like, you know, one of those intractable situations. You know, we, we called for community meetings, we called for dialogue, and you know, they figured out rather quickly, they could still have the same amount of car lanes, but choke them down, which is great, because it allowed room for the bike lane, but it also slowed down the vehicle traffic without having to have any cops or radar out there. And you know what? It's working beautifully ever since. And now, you know, with the new BART station, um, you know, you can enter from Maybury, right? I mean, you can, you can come down from the East Foothills and, and take McKee or take, as you well know, and take Penitentia Creek now. Um, and I think even a kid living along Penitentia Creek, I, I would allow my young child to ride down the BART station on, you know, on that route. That's a safe route, relatively speaking. So um, one overpass that you've got to overcome there, but um, 
you know, this is the kind of work we need to keep doing in, in essentially put the kind of law enforcement that we're doing now out of business, much like we talked about putting juvenile hall out of business. Get it out of business by changing the way you do business. That's, I love that. That's, that's beautiful. <laughs> um, I'm actually, I'm going to turn it over now to Emma Schlaes on our team, and she's going to pull some questions out of the chat box. So, Emma. Good morning, Supervisor. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, I have some questions from the chat. Uh, one commenter says, I would love to see more streets closed to cars during COVID for biking, walking, and dining. And they said that San Jose has not yet done this, um, although other cities have. Is this something the county could help um, promote or incentivize with some of the local cities? Yeah, the county's all for it. Um, I think what happens, the way government jurisdictions have been set up in California, um, with the exception of San Francisco, which is a joint city-county blend, it's, it's, it's a hybrid, Everybody else, the other 57 counties are separate from the cities, yet in some of these areas like restaurants, you know, in uh, this whole uh, idea of, of outdoor dining and closing streets down, which a lot of us would have liked to have seen again years ago um, in some of our urban areas uh, to, to create more pedestrian and bicycle friendly areas, um, like, like a day like a day-to-day -day festival happening all the time. You know, that's how a lot of us would like to see things in our urban areas. So the, the cooperation there is that the county needs to make sure that they're, they're signing off on the health department side. That's the side the county runs. You know, what do you need to do to be health ready um, to satisfy your health permit if you're gonna move things outdoors? Um, and the city just, you know, and I think they're trying to do that in San Jose, as I understand it, needs to just absolutely streamline whatever permit process they want to use to uh, to regulate how people do that. I, I, I suppose if I was over there, like the old days, I'd be arguing just deregulate it right now. Just let people move outdoors and we'll catch up with the regulation later. I was in uh, Florence once. I don't know how many people on this webinar have ever been there. Uh, I don't get to travel <laughs> that much, so don't think of me as a world traveler, but um, I went on my own dime one year because we have a Florence Sister County Commission in Santa Clara County, and I was the liaison. So I went over there and, and went into the, the Medici um, uh, Palace where the County of Florence meets. And I asked them, all these vendors and cafes and everything outside, how do you, how do you regulate that? You know, what kind of permit fees do you charge? And they said, we don't. It's a beautiful thing, you know. Whoever wants to set up, they set up. And look at, you know, it's a destination for people all over the world. Yeah. It, seems, it seems to work all right. That's amazing, wow. Um, love to see that more here. So some other questions. Uh, so someone asked that, you know, the, the building out of bicycle networks in some of the cities has been very good, but um, they feel like there's less funding spent on data collection um, and just measuring things. So is there anything, what are the funding priorities? How does that kind of get funded, if you know, um, for, the, for the county or the region for data collection on bike bikeways particularly? Well, we're getting better at it. I mean, I think the, the, the MTC, which I was talking about earlier, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, when it comes to Bay Area, um, data, which, I mean, that kind of data work, I think really needs to be done Bay Area wide. I mean, we have 157,000 vehicle in commutes every day for work, at least we did pre-COVID, um, and they're then dispersed to the nine counties once they come in from the Central Valley. And then within the nine counties, I mean, nobody is really staying in their home county anymore. Um, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But people, there's no natural boundaries, is all I'm trying to say. So that kind of data work is best done at the regional level. Regional data collection depends on cooperation from the cities and the counties. And you, you just can't have cities and counties ever saying, we don't want to send you that data to aggregate it and to do better work and to figure out, you know, how to prioritize funding because then, because then we have to hire people to sift through the data to send to you or send us a check for $45,000, you know, so we can, have somebody spend half a year sifting through data. 
you know, that's where things start to get weird between governments. We're all serving the same taxpayers and you just have to, you know, at, at that point, I think our county has been good about this. I really believe that, you know, cooperating and just providing data and resources to the, to the regional governments. But again, there's 101 cities in the Bay Area and they're not all built the same. They're not all funded the same. They're not all as wealthy. And, you know, trying to get the data that they have into a central repository like that, um, you know, probably at some point needs to be needs to be funded with some transportation money for those that jurisdictions that just can't afford to do that on their own. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll certainly, I think it's a good point. I'll certainly make it a priority, more of a priority in the future. Um, uh, we've, we've done some of that and I don't want to dive into the weeds and I can tell you some examples where Santa Clara County has waived, you know, costs and fees and sent a lot of data to the region, but, you know, we're kind of a special county in that, that way. We have, we have a big budget. So uh, good point. I'll make it a priority going forward. Great. Um, and yeah, I know I've participated on a bicycle data collection working group for MTC. So it is something that's being worked on. Yes. Um, so this commenter asks, you know, I know that Santa Clara versus San Mateo County in Santa Clara County, BTA handles a lot of different roles, whereas in San Mateo County, it's a bunch of different agencies. Um, for example, the person says like commute.org handles TDM travel demand management in San Mateo County. Could you just comment on the pros and cons of having these as separate or uh, separate agencies or joint agency from your perspective? I think joint, when it comes to transportation issues, I think as seamless and joint <laughs> as possible yeah. is, is always better. I, you know, because of the way the Bay Area grew, you know, back, I'm, I'll date myself one more time and say, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember the annexation wars in cities like Milpitas and San Jose competing for who was going to get which territory, where does Berryessa end and where does Milpitas mm -hmm. start? Those were just ad hoc, you know, imperialistic expansions. Somebody told me at one time the Bay Area grew like Europe um, in the same kind of, without the, without the violent wars, they were these uh, municipal land grabs. And so what we ended up with is way too many transportation agencies, way too many school districts, uh, way too many fire agencies. Um, and, you know, now you're going back, I mean, we are going back, you know, trying to, like you talk about data or TDM or whatever, trying to, to do what private industry would do in a very streamlined way. Um, and you got all these jurisdictions that even if they want to talk to each other, aren't on the same platform. So it's it's it, it's something we got to keep working on. Like I said earlier, as mundane as merging the MTC and the APEG staff together may sound, um, that's the kind of we got to start going in that direction now. Consolidating governments, not to take away local control, but at least consolidate the staffing. If nothing else, you know, if you can't fight with people who want to hold on to their governance at least get people to, to merge more staffs like we did with MTC and ABEG. So the people are sitting side by side in cubicles, you know, engineering what we need engineered. And um, I, I hope that's not too general of a response, but that's probably, probably the best I can respond to it. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of movements around that as well as we talked about earlier. Well, that's a separate issue, but yeah, there's seamless Bay Area that's working to unite things more. Um, okay, I think one more question uh, that I had, not from the chat, but, um, you know, there's kind of constant conversation about allowing bikes on county expressways. I know that the county is going to be doing a bike plan for unincorporated roads, and that'll include their plan for expressways. Do you have any thoughts on that issue? Yeah, I think for expressways in general, you know, should have for the most part, there may be a couple exceptions out there. I mean, keep in mind there's 67 miles of county expressways in this county. There's no county in California that has a system like that. Um, it's like a highway system that's owned by the county. And frankly, it shouldn't be a highway system. It should be at most a boulevard system. And, you know, a good place to start, I think, from a planning standpoint, an urban planning standpoint, and I think the cycling community should be a 
big part of this kind of thinking and planning is, is let's, let's start boulevarding these expressways. You know, it's okay um, that they're already so congested first and foremost, again, in non-pandemic times that they're kind of self-choked down, but you know what? Choke them down a little bit more. Um, make it safer for bikes and pedestrians. Uh, th there were epidemic types of, of numbers of uh, fatalities along Capitol Expressway uh, because it's not lit. People try to cross at night and it's like crossing a freeway. And of course you're trying to cross at night. Um, to bring up the example I brought up earlier, you got Eastridge on one side and suburbia on the other side and people are trying to cross the street. Why wouldn't they? You're telling them don't take your car a walk or don't take your car a bike. And then we don't create, you know, we, we create an extremely unsafe 70 mile an hour vehicle environment for them to try to navigate. It's, it's not good. So um, I think this whole idea of keep fighting for uh, slowing traffic down by necking down by, you know, this expressway should not be exempt from traffic calming. Um, take advantage of the fact that there's congestion by, um, you know, by, by saying we, we, don't, we don't need the high speed out there. We're not going to get it anyway. Um, you know, I, I just think it's that kind of thinking that needs to prevail. So, um, but we, we shouldn't have a 67 mile network of expressways that crisscrosses the county um, that's not bike accessible. That, that's just a shame. Thank you so much, Supervisor Cortese. This was very enlightening and it's really, it's wonderful to hear someone in your position who's so in tune with these issues and um, leading to help make the streets safe for everybody and in particular bicyclists. So thanks for spending time with us this morning. Well, thank you very much. And I do want to say I have a lot to learn still, even after 20 years on all these agencies, especially from the cycling community. So please keep it coming, keep educating me and I'll keep trying to do my job. Thank you. Uh, ne next thing we're going to be knocking on your door for is make transit free, make bike share public transit, make it all free. So that's how it, that's how it should have been right from the beginning. Yep. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Take care.